I don't have the chat currently open, so if anyone has any questions or if I, something I say doesn't make sense or something on the slides appears to be wrong, just um, unmute and tell me. Uh, so, okay, so we're talking about geodesic growth in virtually billion groups. It, the title, it sounds like a sort of something that should really be obvious and even when we go into the, uh, the definitions of the problem, it still sounds like it should be an easy, something that's easy to, easy to solve, something that's obvious, but it's far from, the proof is far from uh, immediate and far from obvious. So let's uh, just start with where the problem came from. So the idea of growth in groups is of course well studied with uh, some of the more famous results being Gromov's classification of groups with polynomial regular growth. So those groups being precisely the ones with, which are virtually nilpotent. And of course, Gregorchuk's example of a group with intermediate growth, which of course sparked a lot of interest in those particular classes of groups and similar groups. So it was asked in, uh, I suppose, 2012, and I suppose it was asked before that by these four authors. Uh, if, there, if there are similar results or these results can be generalized to a uh, sort of similar notion known as geodesic growth. So they asked, is there a classification of groups with polynomial geodesic growth? And uh, if there exists any groups with intermediate geodesic growth? Uh, so uh, towards these questions, they, they uh, showed that in, for the case of just nilpotent groups, there's no such thing as an intermediate geodesic growth group. So a nilpotent group can either be virtually uh, cyclic and, and have polynomial geodesic growth, or it can be not virtually cyclic and be exponential geodesic growth with respect to all generating sets. Uh, and uh, in the same paper, they showed a sufficient condition for a virtually abelian group to have polynomial geodesic growth with respect to at least one generating set, just one very specific generating set. So, uh, so that's about all that was known. Uh, so uh, in this talk, we'll be taking the next step in this study by uh, showing a sort of characterization for the geodesic growth of virtually abelian groups. Uh, in particular, we'll show that there's no such thing as an intermediate, uh, sorry, and there's no such thing as a virtually abelian group with intermediate geodesic growth. And we'll show a uh, more analytic classification of these groups, of, of the growth of these particular groups. So, uh, so sorry. Um, yeah. You have a look at this block or something in the bottom right corner that kind of obscures a part oh, of the screen. So yeah. I believe that's the, that's okay. your window with the participants of the talk. Yeah. Oh, thank okay, you. Thank I, you. I, I had no idea that, that was visible. Uh, yeah, sure. No, thank you. Go on. Uh, so if there's any other problems, just someone let me know, just yell at me. Uh, so, okay. So that should be fine. So I suppose we'll start with our definitions. So in this talk, uh, our groups will be generated as a monoid by uh, a finite generating set, which we'll use the notate, we'll um, write S for our finite generating set. And when I say generated like a monoid, I'm saying that we don't necessarily assume inverses in our generating set. We can do that, of course, and everything's the same, but necessarily we won't, that's fine. Uh, so we say that a word in our generating set S is a geodesic if it represents its uh, the element of an element of the group with minimal with a minimal length. So that means that if any other word represents the same element of the group, then it has to do so with then it has to have at least the length of uh, that word. So sigma is a geodesic here because any other word that represents the same element has to be the same length or longer. Uh, so then we define the geodesic growth function just to count the number of geodesics uh, up to a certain length. Uh, so then similar to as we do with regular growth, we say that uh, a group has uh, exponential geodesic growth if it has a lower bound, which is an exponential. So uh, 
here we have like alpha to the n lower bound has a lower bound for our uh, duties of growth function in that example it has polynomial duties of growth if we have a polynomial upper bound on the uh, growth function and intermediate duties of growth otherwise so sets the same sort of definitions that we have with usual growth uh, so let's just give an example of this of duties of growth let's give a particularly simple example so for the group z squared uh, we can see that with respect to the usual generating set of just uh, usual generating set for z squared that it automatically has to have exponential duties of growth in that case because if we just consider maybe an element which is just going on the diagonal of the integer lattice so x to the n y to the n then there are there's already exponentially many ways we can represent that element so here x to the n y to the n we can commute the letters x and y however we want and there's two n choose n ways that we can uh, commute those letters so there's already exponentially many choices in this case the we have the we can compute the uh, duties of growth function explicitly as I as hopefully that's correct on the slide uh, in this case it's also the it's also a fact that it doesn't matter what generating set you choose for z z squared it's always going to have exponential duties of growth uh, as long as it as long as that generates the group of course uh, and it's also a fact that uh, if you have an epimorphism onto z squared then that then that uh, if you have a group which has an epimorphism onto z squared then that group also has to have exponential geodesic growth for every generating set that's just because we can always we can always lift we can lift any geodesic in z squared up to the group we started with in that case we can always lift geode the geodesics through this epimorphism so that's fine so we might be thinking okay so it's still kind of similar to usual growth like usual growth is the concept of growth is uh, invariant under quasi isometry but uh, we may notice here that I I've said an epimorphism uh, so in general it's not really enough it's not enough for this statement it's, it's not enough that the group contains z squared it has to have an epimorphism onto z squared so why is this important uh, if say like consider maybe the presentation because it may maybe the group z to the n maybe here n can be two if we're going from the previous slide uh, so consider this presentation what happens if we add another generator t for instance and we give this generator t uh, a uh, degree equivalent to a degree of n so and we just make it so that this letter t commutes every generator of our z to the n subgroup to the next generator of z to the n so this group contains z to the n as a subgroup that's fine in, in fact it contains n, n copies of the subgroup z to the n so if n was two this would be two copies of z squared so it contains z squared which can only have exponential duties of growth and nothing else so what about this group well if we chose our generating set right if we chose this particular generating set i have on the slide currently where we're just picking one generator of, of our group and our letter t then with respect to this generating set we would have polynomial duties of growth uh, the reason for this is if you the reason for this is that any geodesic in this particular group can only have a boundedly many instances of, boundedly many instances of the letter t so if you found it if you found a word with two n instances in instances of the letter t then you can find a, a shorter word which represents the same element of our group of our group with uh, fewer instances of the letter t so that's fine so we can tell that 
we're already not quasi isometric invariant. It's a bit, it's maybe a bit harder to maybe study this sort of thing. Uh, and it gets even more interesting that this sort of trick, we can also do this sort of trick for the Heisenberg group. So we can find a group which is virtually Heisenberg. In particular, it contains the Heisenberg group of, uh, of uh, rank, the of degree two, oh, sorry. It contains oh, two copies of the virtually of the Heisenberg group. Sorry. Uh, and with respect to some generating set, this group has polynomial geodesic growth. However, I won't really go over this proof because it's it's kind of tedious. The proof the, the this example it's it's kind of it's not um, it's not hard, but it's kind of tedious. But if people want to know about it, I can talk about it later. So let's continue on. Okay. So since we're talking about geodesics in uh, the vir these virtually abelian groups, what we really need to study them is we need something sort of like a normal form. So we can't have a, we're not really interested in normal forms, in a normal form for our geodesics because that would only give us one example of each element for each element and we want to we want to have we want to count every geodesic for each element. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to define define something called a patterned word. Uh, so this was originally introduced by uh, Benson uh, when he showed when he showed that uh, virtually abelian groups have rational growth, rational regular growth that is. So let G be a virtually z to the n group where it contains a z to the n as a normal subgroup of finite degree. Oh, so, yep. And, uh, oh, sorry, finite index D. Uh, then the first step of this is to take this generating set S and then we're going to generate, we're going to take two sets Y and P, uh, which are going to contain words of length at most D in the generating set S, where Y is going to contain a words of length at most D, at least one, length of least one, length of most D, which represent an element in the Z to the N subgroup, and they have no proper prefix which represents an element in the Z to the N subgroup. So the idea here is that a word, a word in P, as we're reading that word left to right, uh, we only hit the z to the n subgroup uh, just once at the end, at the end of reading that word. Hopefully that makes sense. And we have our generating set P, oh sorry, we have, we have another set P, which is going to contain words of length at most D, which don't contain anything in Y as a subword. So maybe the thing to, the way to think of these two sets is that Y contains things that are in z to the n, and P contains things that change our coset that aren't in Z to the N. So uh, if we, if we uh, have some word in the letters, sorry, some word in P, which we're gonna call pi of length at most D. So it can only be of length at most D, it can't be any longer. We're gonna call that a pattern. And then we're gonna choose a vector V uh, which uh, I realize there's something missing from this slide. If you're wondering what the M is in that, uh, in the power of the, uh, the N to the K plus one M, M is meant to be the size of, of the set Y. I'm sorry, I must have, I must have uh, forgotten to put that back in. So, so we have some, word pi, we have some vector v. Then we say that uh, the, together this v pi is a patterned word where using this patterned word, we can get a, a word in our generating set s, which we're gonna denote v to the power of pi, uh, which represents this word that's on this, this ugly word that's on the slide. So unfortunately, as I said, I. I somehow forgot to put it back in the slide, but uh, this 
y sub 1 to y sub n are meant to be the elements of y, the, the, uh, the set uppercase y. So the idea here is that uh, our, pat, our uh, word pi can be of length of most d. So there's only finitely many things can, for us to consider. There's only finitely many cases we have to consider there. And uh, between these letters of pi, we just stick things that are in z to the n. So they can commute with each, they can commute among each other, that's fine. Uh, so this, this sort of form is like a lot nicer to look at, but uh, I suppose it's not quite clear why we're uh, interested in this seemingly obscure sort of way of looking at our words. So the reason why we're interested in this is that uh, for any word in our generating set S, so any sigma in S star, we can find a patterned word, v pi, uh, for which the word v uh, to the power of pi I have there represents the same element as sigma, the word we started with, with the same length. So, so the idea here is that uh, if you have a geodesic, then you can do, do some sort of uh, do some sort of like shuffling of that word and come up with a patterned word which is also which also represents a geodesic v superscript pi so v super pi so still that's that's okay that's uh interesting and all but it do, it's not immediately obvious that we can study all geodesics this way so in order to make this applicable to our problem we kind of need to uh define exactly how we get these patterned words. This is maybe one of the key parts of the, of the proof. Uh, so the idea is that uh, we define some map, uh, uppercase delta I have here, such that uh, using this map, we can kind of like process our word that we started with uh, sigma, uh, from left to right, and event and eventually get in pa get a patterned word. So maybe I shouldn't spit, read all of this since uh, I'm already halfway through the allotted time, or just about. But um, the idea is that we start we start by representing some pattern some pattern word, which is just uh, the empty vector to well no pattern at all. So this, so this on, hopefully people can see my cursor, down the bottom left, we're representing basically uh, the empty word concat uh, concatenated with uh, sigma. And so the idea is that uh, at each step of this algorithm, we apply this map delta to kind of move a bit of the word sigma into the vector uh, u in this case. So the idea is that, um, we only need to really look at the first D letters of, of the word sigma. And then we, we choose something in there that uh, represents uh, an element of uh, the Z to the N subgroup. We take that, we put it into the vector U, and then maybe we change this, uh, this pattern tau as we go along, just, just so we have somewhere to put this, this thing we picked out. Uh, so, Okay, so, and the idea is that with each step of this, with each step of application of this uh, map, we're shortening the, the word sigma. So we're always taking something out of it and putting it into u. So it's getting shorter and shorter, and eventually there's gonna be none of this word sigma left, and we'll just be left with a, a patterned word, well, a pattern word uh, v, v pi at the end. And uh, this, this map delta, which I won't go into how to construct, uh, it's in the paper. So uh, it will, with each step, we will have a word which represents the same group element with the same weighted length. So each step, we're not changing the element we're representing, we're not changing the weighted length. Oh, sorry, I don't know why I'm saying weighted length there. I should have said the same length. 
So we're not changing our length at any point. So the thing that we start with, sigma, has this, this represents the same element with the same weight as length as the thing that we end up with, which is phi pi at the end. Hopefully that's clear. People can yell at me otherwise. Okay. So I suppose now you think, okay, so you have this well-defined way of getting this uh, patterned word v pi. Okay, what are, what are we going to do with this? What's the point? So it's, uh, it's the case that we can take this map delta and from it we can define a finite graph, which I'm going to call gamma. Uh, so, and the idea is that uh, for each word sigma that we, that we start with, it's for each word sigma that we give the algorithm, there's a unique path in our graph of the form, of, of the form like about the bottom of this slide here, P subscript sigma. And so there's a path that looks a bit like that, where we start with, we start in a vertex uh, labeled epsilon w, where, and we end in a vertex labeled pi epsilon. So that's fine. Uh, so yeah, okay. So the thing is with these paths, that uh, if I give you one of these paths, then you can is you can actually. Oh, geez. Uh, let me make sure. Yeah. Okay. So the thing about these paths is that I, if I give you one of them, then you can uh, recover what the original word sigma had to be. Uh, maybe I don't I haven't given you enough notation to describe how to do that, but. Trust me, all you have to do is just read through the, the vertices, dub, the labels W on the vertices, and it's possible to recover what the original word sigma had to be. And uh, you can also recover what the, uh, what the patterned word that you ended up with at the end had to be. So you know what the, the pattern had to be pi because it's in the last vertex there. And you know what the vector V had to be by reading off the labels on the edges. Uh, I might not go into too much detail there, but unless someone wants me to later on. So, so the idea is that uh, if we consider all of these, the set of all of these paths with, of this form, which, uh, let me see, okay. If we consider the set of all these paths, which probably enough I'm just gonna call path, uh, which uh, start in a vertex which has ep epsilon in the uh, first component of the vertex label, hopefully that isn't too confusing, and ends up in a uh, vertex with epsilon in the second component. Uh, if we consider those, then we actually have a bijection between the words in uh, our generating set S and the paths in path. So, uh, so for each sigma in S star, we can find a path and in each path there's a unique sigma that we could have started with. So that's fine. So, yep. So the idea now is that we, instead of studying the geodesic Sorry, instead of studying the words of our uh, virtually abelian group, we're going to study paths in this graph gamma. And uh, fortunately enough, this graph is, well, finite. Uh, so it's quite possible to study this. Um, okay. I wish I went to that slide earlier because it highlighted everything I just wanted to highlight. Okay. So before we continue with this, I'm going to have, it seems like we're going off in a bit of tangent here, but we're not quite. I'm going to have to define something called polyhedral sets. Now, as you can see, this, this definition might be a bit different to, slightly different to what the definition that, well, is in most literature. 
that the idea is that the polyhedral set is just uh, a finite a finite union of and finite intersection of these particular types of sets that I have in this definition box here. So these three types of sets are called elementary regions. Take finite inter intersections of those and you get a basic polyhedral set and then take finite disjoint unions of those basic polyhedral sets as, and you get a polyhedral set. So that's fine. The reason why we have to define things like this is just so that we have these nice closure properties in this remark down in the bottom here. And these closure properties are really what we need in order to, well, make these sort of concepts uh, useful to proving our final result. So, okay. So we have this rather nice definition of set. So where do we go from here? Uh, using these closure properties that, funnily enough, I just got rid of on the slide, we can show that for any pattern pi, there we can come up with a polyhedral set such that a vector is in that polyhedral set if and only if the patterned word uh, v pi is a geodesic in our group. So this is quite nice. Like we, we have a a um, we have a way of just picking out which things are geodesics and it's relatively nice. So where do we go from here? Oh, okay. Where, where do we go from here? Another seeming, tan, seeming tangent, which will be wrapped up, I think, after this, after this slide. So the next thing that I'm going to have to define for you is uh, the class of holonomic functions. So if people saw my talk abstract, I claim that the geodesic, sorry, I claim that the generating function for the geodesic growth series is holonomic. So what does this mean? So a holonomic function or d finite is, uh, funny enough, a lot of, a lot of uh, authors prefer, uh, is, the fi is, a, is, is a function such that if you take the partial derivative, all, partial, all possible partial derivatives of that function, then the span of that is just a finite dimensional vector space, or the span of it over the field of rational functions. So the idea is that uh, there are only, f if you, there are fi there's a choice of finitely many partial derivatives from this set x sub f, such that if you choose any other, uh, partial derivative from that set, then it can be written as a linear combination of those finite choices that you made earlier with just coefficients that are rational functions. So that's fine. And uh, in the case of a one variable holonomic function, then you just end up with the class of functions which satisfy differential equations where the coefficients are uh, oh, that's a mistake. That should be a rational function down there. Down there, not a polynomial. So there's a class of functions that satisfy differential equations where the coefficients are, are rational functions, if I didn't say anything incorrect there. That's fine. Oh, sorry, that's a bit of a typo there. So, okay. So why am I telling you about this? Well, polynomial functions have... Uh, some nice closure properties, which, which uh, some of them I have on the slide here. But the main one I think that we'll need for what I'm gonna say next is that uh, if you have a holonomic function of many variables, then you can kind of squash it to one variable you, and, uh, and it's still holonomic. So this, this other set of variables y, that could include only one variable y sub one if you wanted to and all of these uh, algebraic functions, a sub one to a sub n, they could just be y maps to y, that's fine. And you could just squash everything to one variable if you wanted to. Uh, but um, maybe we don't get too hung up on that just yet. Uh, and the other thing that makes holonomic functions interesting for this sort of problem 
is that they can only have finitely many singularities. So, so if you have a, uh, an, a, if you choose any point for which that function is defined, then there'll be only finitely many points that you can't, you can't find a, uh, an analytic solution to that, to that function. So this, I'm going around in circles now. There are only, so this, there are only finitely many singularities. Let's leave it at that. Uh, so why is this important? Why are we even remotely interested in it having finitely many singularities? Well, we can apply what's called polya carlson theorem in this case, that if we have a holonomic function with integer coefficients, then it's the case that either that function is uh, a rational function, or it has the unit circle as its natural boundary. So in the case of holonomic functions, it's not possible for it to have a natural boundary because having a natural boundary requires you to have infinitely many singularities. This just means that you're not allowed to, you're not able to extend the function analytically. You know, not, sorry, you're not allowed to do an analytic continuation of the function beyond the unit circle. You would require infinitely many singularities for that to be true, which is not true in this case. So since we're interested in geodesic growth functions, these functions, well, they give you integer values. Okay. So if we define a, a, uh, a power series with coefficients given by the uh, geodesic growth function, then it's going to have integer, then that function is going to have integer coefficients. If that function is also holonomic, then we know that uh, either, oh, geez, I just realized it's written on the slide. I hope, every, I hope people realize that I, miss, I misread Polio Carlson theorem. So, in poly Carlson theorem, we, if, the, if we have a power series with integer coefficients, which is defined within the open unit circle, so it has a, uh, an interval of convergence of at least one, then it's either rational or has the unit circles as a natural boundary. I'm sorry if that didn't make sense when I said it. So going back to our corollary down here, uh, so if we have a geodesic growth function, then it's the case that either that geodesic growth function has exponential growth, in which case the, uh, the uh, interval of the um, radius of convergence of the power series will be less than one. So poly Carlson theorem can't be applied. We either have that or we have that uh, the uh, Geodesic growth series uh, is not if does not have exponential growth, and in which case it can be shown that this uh, generating function uh, must have a uh, radius or must have a radius convergence of at least one, in which case we can apply poly Carlson theorem, and to show that this function has to indeed be rational, and and so we have a rational function, which is not exponential. So it has to have a polynomial upper bound by some well-known facts of rational functions. So in this case, if this were true, and if the conditions of this corollary were true, then our growth series would either be exponential or polynomial. It can't be intermediate. Uh, and just what I said about rational functions is right there. Uh, so, yep. So, yep, either polynomial or exponential if it's holonomic in this case. So, uh, okay, so we're still going off on seeming tangents, which won't be tangents after all. Uh, so, now I'm going to have to define for you what a formal language is because we're gonna actually be using formal languages to show our, our result of, um, of the, uh, on geodesic growth. So 
if we give it a, if we have a finite set sigma, then we're going to call this an alphabet. And we say that a, uh, a set is a formal language if it's a subset of sigma star, the free monoid generated by sigma. So, I mean, this is kind of like a nebulous sort of definition, I suppose, because it's like, well, what, what restriction does that put? But the idea of formal language theory is to study classes of formal language. So you have some model of description and then what things can you represent by that and what closure properties do they have? So maybe one example of such of a class of formal language is regular language, which hopefully some people know. Uh, so I'm gonna give some, maybe a bit of a different definition uh, so if, if you had a finite directed edge labeled graph uh, where the labels are given by sigma, then if you chose any two vertices in that graph, uh, and then you took all of the paths between those two vertices, uh, then the, and then you read out the labels on those, on those paths, then that would be a regular language. And that's kind of equivalent to the definition of regular language. Well, it is. Uh, so, so yeah, so just a finite graph, just choose any two vertices, read out the labeling on the edges and form words out of that. That's, your, that's a regular language. Uh, so the class of regular languages is closed under union, intersection and set difference. So yeah, some pretty standard things there. The reason why I'm, only introducing regular language here is that where I'm, I'm going to use this word later on. But um, yeah, so just think of a finite path and a finite graph, and that's okay. And maybe ignore this small typo here. Uh, so maybe an example of a, re of a regular language which is well relevant to what we have here in, in, this, in the slides is that uh, from before, if hopefully we remember it from all those slides ago, uh, the set of paths in our, which are called path, strangely enough, uh, is a regular language. So from before, a few slides earlier, we found some graph where every uh, vertex, uh, where every path is, um, in bijection with a word in uh, our generating set for our virtually abelian group that we started with. Hopefully I didn't go in circles there too much. So now that, I'd, now that I've given you this example, yet another tangent, I'm afraid. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to define something called a the class of polyhedrally constrained languages, so a bit of a more complicated class of language. So in order to define this, I'm going to need something called the Perique map or the Perique image. So the idea of that is just, um, if you're given some word in uh, the free mono generated by sigma, then the Perique image is just uh, count up the, the number of instances of each letter, put that into a vector and that's your Perique image. So the pre image just count, is just a vector counting the number of instances of each particular letter. So that's fine. Uh, so using the pre image, you can define something called the multivariant generating function. When people define generating functions for formal languages, they only are really interested in one variable thing. But in this case, we'll need multivariable ones. So the idea here is that uh, uh, if you're given some language L, uh, and then if you read the coefficient of uh, x to the i1, x, x to the i2, up to xm to the im, if you read that coefficient, then that coefficient counts the number of words in the language L, which have uh, i1 instances of the letter sigma 1, i2 instances of the letter sigma 2, all the way up to im instances of the letter sigma m. So we're really just counting, we're really just counting like the number of things that are in this language L. So that's fine. 
Uh, okay. So maybe I'll give you an example of a of a generating function for a language. Hopefully we have enough time to get through the rest of the slides. We do, I hope. Uh, so I haven't defined what context-free languages are and I won't in these slides. So if you don't, so maybe we can just ignore that. But uh, if we had this language that I'm probably not calling L again here, uh, and this, lang this language just contains words in the letters A, B, C, and D, which can be in, you can just mix those up in any order you like. And the only thing that we're, we really require here is that words in this language have to have as many instances of the letter C as they have instances of the letter D. So if you have 10 instances of C, you have 10 instances of D in a word. Uh, so if we were to compute the multivariant generating function of this language, then we end up with this ugly uh, power series here, which uh, if, you, uh, if you try hard enough, or maybe you just put it into, I don't know, sage math or something, you come up with uh, something that looks roughly like uh, this thing here, which is, and it's quite clear that uh, this generating, this function here is, al is algebraic. It's an algebraic function. Uh, and it's in fact the case that that, uh, that all unambiguous context-free languages, so a very specific subclass of these class of context-free languages, which I have, I'm not going to define, they all have algebraic uh, multivariant generating functions. So that's okay. Uh, so so uh, in this slide, in this talk, we're, we're going to be interested in an, another class of language a slightly different one called uh, polyhedrally constrained. And the reason why we're interested in this is that we're going to show, and is that uh, these, this class of languages have holonomic uh, multivariant generating functions. So that weird class of, of uh, generating function that I mentioned earlier, that's what they have. So, in this definition, I'm using the term unambiguous context-free language again, but for the purpose of these slides, we don't need the full power of this definition. So for the purpose of these slides, we'll, we're, I'll just replace it with regular language because regular language is, in, is this, every regular language is an unambiguous context-free. So it's okay for this. So given some regular language U, if you and a polyhedral set P, uh, a polyhedrally constrained language is just take every is just take every uh, word in that language U, whose Perique image, so the number of instances of each of each uh, letter in the word, so this Perique image belongs to that set P. So we're really just picking things out, uh, just using this set P. Uh, so as I said, polyhedral constrained languages have holonomic multivariant generating functions, quite nice. So why is, why is this interesting at all? Well, it's just the case that um, if you want to pick out the paths in the graph that we mentioned way, way ago in the previous slides, if you want to pick out the paths which correspond to geodesics in our virtually abelian group, and only those, then it's possible to show that that's a polyhedrally constrained language. So, so from, a few, from many slides ago, I showed that uh, all the pattern words who's, um, that correspond to geodesics, you can pick those out using a polyhedral set. You can kind of, you can kind of use that result to show that you can, you can pick out the paths which correspond to geodesics using the same sort of polyhedral set. So that's fine. So now we have this set path, subscript G or geodesic, I suppose. So we have this, this set, which, which corresponds to the geodesics of our virtually abelian group. And we know that we have a bijection from these paths to our geodesics in uh, our group from, well, hopefully if people remember from the previous slide, we had that. So, 
So the idea here is that uh, using this bijection, we can kind of, we can uh, take this result about uh, polyhedrally constrained languages having holonomic generating functions, and we can say that uh, the generating function for our GD's growth series is also holonomic. So if we uh, if we defined a so the the meaning of this is that if we defined a a generating function whose uh, a single variable generating functions whose coefficients are the uh, uh, the the GD's growth series so the first coefficient is the number of GD's of length almost zero the second coefficient the first co the coefficient of uh, x1 x is the number of uh, geodesics of length up to one etc like yeah so the coefficient of x to the n is the number of geodesics of length up to n so if we did that then it had that function has to be holonomic because of this bijection uh, i won't go into too much detail about how all this works i i suppose i wasn't didn't go into too much detail about how we obtain this bijection, but uh, yeah, I suppose all the details are in the paper. Uh, so, so now that we have this result, we can apply a polio Carlson theorem from before to say that uh, our the GDZ growth of a virtually abelian group has to either be polynomial or exponential. Uh, and the GDZ growth series is holonomic, but it also has to be rational if it's polynomial GDZ growth. That's quite nice. Okay. So that was this, that the previous slide was maybe our main result of this talk. Uh, since we don't have much time, fortunately enough, these, we only have three slides left. That's good. Uh, so from before we used a class of formal language to show our growth result of uh, virtually abelian groups. So what if we wanted to classify the formal, the, what if we wanted a formal language classification of the geodesics in our virtually abelian group? Well, this, uh, this bijection that we came up with before, it's not a monoid homomorphism. It doesn't have too many like nice properties. So we can't immediately come up with some formal language classification for the geodesics in our virtually abelian group. Uh, but it's, it's the case that we can in fact, come up with a, a different kind of classification called uh, blind multi-counter. Uh, hopefully I have a bit longer, might, I might go a bit over time, but that's okay. Uh, maybe we only have a few minutes for questions. Okay, uh, so informally a blind multi-counter automata, sorry, blind multi-counter language is, well, what I have written there, but maybe that particular definition is indecipherable to people that haven't, uh, that don't have experience with um, theory, some with formal language theory. So uh, instead of going through this definition I have on the slides, I'm gonna give you maybe a more understandable example. So if we recall from our slides, many slides before, I gave a weird definition, sort of like maybe non-standard sort of definition of what a regular language is. And I said that a regular, well, a regular language is just choose any two vertices in a finite graph and then just read out the labels on, on the edges between, of any path between those two vertices. So that was a regular language. Uh, so if we modify this definition slightly and, oh, and we, uh, we add to each label, that should really be V sub two and V sub one there. Somehow that didn't come out right, but that's okay. So if we modify our graph so that it also has, it's also labeled with um, elements of uh, Z to the K. Uh, and then we also require that uh, if you add up all, these, all of these, uh, V sub i's, then you just end up with zero. If we make this restriction, then what we end up with is something called a blind K counter or 
oh, sorry, a blind cane counter language. So a blind cane counter, I'm oh, sorry, a blind multi counter language is just the union of all blind k counter languages, you know, where k is finite. So that's fine. So, okay. So this is maybe the definition we're gonna use. So it's basically just regular languages with maybe some other weird restriction. Uh, fortunately, we don't have many slides, two more. So I suppose with this slide, uh, when someone talks about some weird new, some weird uh, class of formal language that people hadn't heard of before, people always usually ask, how does it fit into the Chomsky hierarchy of things? So how does it fit in with classes of formal languages like regular context free and context sensitive? So if anyone has this question, this is where it fits. And uh, this Venn diagram is completely correct. So yeah, so there's a little bit of intersection here with context free, but yeah, that's fine. Uh, so since we don't have much time, we have one more slide. Uh, okay, so the final result that we have in this, the final slide that we have in this presentation is the, is the fact that uh, the set of geodesics in a virtually abelian group form a blind multi counter language. So this class of formal language that I defined earlier, well, we can use that to, uh, to uh, generate all of the geodesics in our virtually abelian group. So it has, a, the geodesics have a rather nice description. The idea of this is that we use these uh, vectors, v sub i, v sub whatever, whatever they were, we use those to keep track of um, our v in our patent in our patent word if people remember that slide and uh, and we use the uh, the graph to kind of like um, compute what that patent word has to be I won't go into too much detail since that would take maybe another hour but yeah details in the paper uh, so okay maybe I lied about that being the last slide so we have a few uh, open questions here. So I suppose the next step would be to generalize this to virtually nilpotent groups. Uh, and just generally, what does, can we generalize this? Can we generalize this question? So I think I'll leave it at that. And I'll, because my time is up, I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So I have unmuted everyone. Uh, if there are any questions for Alex, feel free to ask. Well, I have one question. So you mentioned that uh, there will um, this this polyhedral set. So the polyhedral set depends, or at, uh, at least that's the impression I got. The polyhedral set for a given group and given generating set, I guess heavily depends on the generating set because if I choose different generating sets, it will be a very different polyhedral set. That's right, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so uh, um, all of this, all of these definitions heavily depend on generating sets. I suppose there are cases where we will have groups that can only ever have exponential geodesic growth and I mean, there's nothing, it depends on whether you find that interesting or not, but uh, yeah, in, in general, it very heavily depends. These things very heavily depend on generating set, which makes it maybe a bit more difficult. And another question that I have is, so if I'm given a generating set of certain size, mm -hmm. no, or is the complexity of the polyhedral set, like how bad, is its description like that corresponds somehow to like how bad is the generating set? Oh, um, well, constructing these polyhedral sets, it kind of heavily depends on a lot of different closure properties of polyhedral sets. Mm -hmm. And I'm not quite sure if the size of it is, is uh, if it has a nice bound. So I think if you, if you even change the generating set slightly, you could just go crazy. The description could just explode. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions for Alex? Yes, Susan, go on. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about, so in some sense you proved this exponential or polynomial due to as it grows in the first and then the blind multi-counter thing, if I understand correctly. But I'm wondering if it's what is known about growth of blind multi-counter languages. Is it known that there is one of those that has intermediate growth? Uh, I, I believe there is actually. There, I, oh, um, actually, no, I contradict myself. Uh, I don't think there's a blind multi-counter language which is known to have intermediate growth, but there are blind multi-counter languages which have non-definite growth. Oh, sorry, have non-definite generating sets. And mm -hmm. uh, there's no real known classifications for blind multi-counter. It's a bit it's a bit too general for there to be anything too nice. Okay. All right, any other questions for Alex? Just a comment to Susan that there was another strategy to go from the blind multi-counter to the, like with all the structure that you had, but we kind of like the, um, the definite method. Oh yeah, um, so what Murray is mentioning is that uh, when I was talking about this class of uh, polyhedrally constrained languages, I was only really interested in when this was a regular language. And it just so happens that that particular subclass of polyhedrally constrained languages is a subclass of something called a Perique language. And Perique languages just happen to be equivalent to blind multi-counter languages. So it is theoretically possible to use that as a different method of this final proof at the end. Uh, but kind of, it, it, it would kind of like be just as difficult to show and it would just be, yeah, I think this is maybe a bit more natural the way that I, the way that I did it, but yeah. yeah. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions for Alex, let's thank him. So feel free to use your clapping, re <laughs> clapping react or clap your hands. Or knock the table. Okay. And stop sharing. So I'll stop recording now.